So um, the topic of my talk is acquired resistance to EGFR targeted therapies. But before moving into acquired resistance, I just wish to spend a couple of minutes about defining which tumors are indeed sensitive to EGFR targeted antibodies. And then I will briefly review mechanisms of acquired drug resistance to EGFR targeted therapies in colorectal cancers. We'll describe which mechanisms are potentially clinically actionable. And then I'll spend a few words about clonal tumor evolutions after EGFR. EGFR treatment has been discontinued. So as we learn from the TCGA, there is about 50 to 80 percent of colorectal cancer tumors that do indeed carry activation of the RTK RAS signaling pathway. Activation is mainly downstream at the RAS level, as highlighted in this slide. However, as you can see, there's a number of receptor tyrosine kinases that all bite at very, very low frequency carry genetic alterations such as amplification or fusions that do indeed activate the pathway downstream. Whenever we think of tumors that are indeed sensitive to EGFR targeted therapies, we should take into account that not only RAS mutations confer resistance to uh, these therapies, but also potentially all these other alterations which I listed in this slide. Of course, clinically, clinical validation would be challenging, but preclinical models strongly suggest that indeed all these receptor tyrosine kinase alterations can confer resistance. So we heard a lot about left side and right side. We know that tumors are responsive to cetaxim, therefore those that are going to be acquiring resistance during therapy are those on the left side, mainly classified as CMS2. So I just reviewed which tumors are sensitive to EGFR targeted therapies, and I will just briefly remind you which mechanisms of acquired drug resistance have already been described. So there's been a number of studies in the years uh, reporting the emergence of mut RAS mutations either in the blood, in the CFDNA, or in the tissue after patients had become resistant to EGFR-targeted therapies. And uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, the same patient may actually develop multiple mutations at different codons of RAS or mutations even in different genes, including KRAS and RAS and MAC1. And this is summarized effectively in this slide, where you can actually see that about, I would say, 40% of patients uh, would at some point develop the, at least one, if not more, mutations in these genes during the course of their therapy. Uh, what else do we know? We know that uh, occasionally patients may activate, tumors may activate a dif different receptor tyrosine kinase to bypass EGFR inhibition. And uh, there's been a key, few case reports uh, describing emergence of HER2 amplification, which now you can appreciate in this slide. And uh, also, uh, there have been reports of emergence of MET gene amplification again, in the tissue or in the blood, as highlighted in this slide, uh, that emerge as an alternative receptor tyrosine kinase when tumors become resistant to EGFR blockade. Uh, what else do we know? Uh, we know that an alternative mechanism of resistance is the acquisition or actually the emergence of mutations in the EGFR itself actually in the extracellular region of the EGFR, the so-called ectodomain, these mutations, which are listed in this slide, prevent antibody binding, therefore making ineffective uh, the drug treatment. And these have been reported to occur in about 15, 20% of patients. So if you want to summarize in a slide, so these are the major mechanisms that have been reported so far, and uh, how do we actually act on them? Well, there's been, uh, uh, the idea is that if you know uh, which disease you're facing, then uh, you might actually be able to target the molecular phenotype that has uh, emerged once the disease has become resistant. It's a, what we call the potential for positive selection. If you put enough pressure, you select for another target, and then you might be able to target uh, the particular gene. For instance, there's been uh, at least preclinical data showing that uh, when tumors become resistant through emergence of MET amplification, 
and you transplant them in preclinical models, then these mice transplanted with the patient tumor scarring mate amplifications uh, are uh, sensitive to blockade of EGFR and MET. Yet, there's been data, early clinical data as well as preclinical data, saying that when uh, tumors become resistant through an EGFR ectodomain mutation, then uh, other antibody targeting the EGFR can be used. And there was this, the first one was this clinical, preclinical report in mice showing that indeed uh, xenografts uh, carrying the G465E mutation of the EGFR were responsive to a pan-hair inhibitor. And uh, there, is other, there are other antibodies, mixture of antibodies that bind to different epitopes of the EGFR. You can see them, uh, MM151 and SIM004. And they can all be active uh, on the different mutants that be reported. Even panitumumab itself can actually be active on certain mutations that emerge upon cetuximab treatment. In particular, you can see here, if you have a S492R mutation or a K467T mutation, then Pimitumumab may still be an effective option. Uh, you can see uh, this, this, this is exemplified in this, uh, in this line, in which uh, in a patient acquired an EGFR S464L mutation in the blood during treatment with Fulfirian Cetuximab. And there is uh, early uh, clinical data showing that when you uh, treat patient with this antibody mixture, with this novel antibody this mixture, the mutant allele of EGFR are eff effectively targeted and decrease in the circulation. And you can see a nice response here in this particular case. So how do we overcome uh, resistance that is driven by uh, mutations downstream the EGFR itself? Well, in this case, uh, going back to a case report by Ryan Corcoran, this was reported last year, this patient had uh, developed a MEC1 mutation, a K57T, upon treatment uh, uh, with an EGFR-based uh, combination therapy. So the patient got, based on these results, in this, in this single liver biopsy, the patient uh, was treated with panitumumab and trametinib as part of an investigational trial. Uh, the single lesion that was biopsied and that was found to harbor this MEK mutation uh, responded uh, within a, a few months uh, to the experimental combination. But unfortunately, response was not uh, homogeneous among all lesions. Mixed response was seen, and this has already been reported, as you can see here. And what was discovered later on through both liquid biopsies and then uh, tissues biopsies taken post-mortem was that uh, uh, while indeed the MEC mutation was effectively inhibited by the experimental combination of panitumumab and trametinib, at the same time in the blood it, through liquid biopsy, a KRAS Q61H mutation was emerging, suggesting that indeed there were other disease sites that were uh, not mutated for MEC but indeed had a KRAS mutation. This really tells us that clonal evolution and heterogeneity can determine lesion-specific response. It can really make uh, a very a high, a big challenge how to treat patients once they become resistant to EGFR-targeted therapy. Um, so this is not a big surprise because when we also look at the data that have been just been presented by, by the previous speakers, when, whenever we block the EGFR pathway vertically, even with multiple combinations, we always tend to see the same pattern of uh, recurrent mutations. Either there is a amplification or mutations of KRAS or, for example, mutant allele or BRAF. This is, for instance, when we, when we block uh, um, vertically, the EGFR pathway with the uh, combined BRAF MEK inhibitors and EGFR inhibitors in the BRAF mutant colorectal cancer setting. So this seems to be a unique feature uh, of the pathway. It doesn't matter whether you apply a single EGFR in the RAS or BRAF wild type population or you apply doublet or triplet combination in the BRAF mutant. So uh, the outcome will be uh, very similar. The pathway is, uh, uh, will be bypassed by one of these mechanisms. 
And so what we, you know, what we think this is happening from the molecular biology point of view is that indeed these mutations are pre-existing and we can detect them at very low levels in the tissues before starting treatment. And what the treatment does is to select out those resistant clones. And uh, this is really consistent with the uh, model, the Big Bang model that's been proposed by Sotoriva, by which uh, from the very beginning, from when the tumor is still an adenoma, several private mutations accumulate in the very first few divisions of the adenoma itself. So by just taking a look, so there's a number, as you can see here, there is a number, there's a, a great number of mutations that accumulate in just very few cells. And those subclones stay there, latent for, you know, for years until eventually they might emerge when you apply a selective pressure, such as the one that we apply with targeted therapy. And just to give you an idea of the existence of this, uh, uh, this phenomenon, this is this data that uh, Scott Kopp has reported a couple of years ago when we looked at BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, you can see that uh, a fair proportion of BRAF mutant colorectal cancer harbor in the tissue subclones carrying KRAS mutations. Uh, not all resistant mutations may be pre-existing. Uh, there's been reports saying that, for instance, EGFR ectodomain mutations, those conferring, those preventing antibody dry, uh, binding, are hardly ever found in uh, tumors that have not been treated with EGFR therapies. And indeed, uh, this is a, a report indicating that. And this may be consistent uh, with this um, the hypothesis is that cancer cells may actually follow distant, distinct pathways to become resistant to targeted therapy. So there is the pre-existing uh, uh, pre path by which a pre-existing mutation gets selected by the treatment, or there could be a more complex evolutional pathway by which uh, there are no pre-existing you know, genetic alterations conferring resistance to the particular drug. And what we have is we have what we call uh, cancer cell adaptation through the treatment or drug tolerance, if you wish. So these cells down in yellow, the cells, you know, will become quiescent, but they will not really develop a genetic alteration. They may stay there for months. Well, eventually, what would happen at some point, you know, just by slowly replicating, one of them may eventually acquire a mutation that was not present before, and they may eventually confer a growth advantage. For instance, in this cartoon, I depicted uh, the EGFR extracellular domain. So clonal tumor evolution after EGFR targeted therapy. Uh, Scott has already alluded to that. So uh, what we discovered is that when a patient discontinue EGFR targeted therapies, uh, KRAS mutant clones may decline. I say may decline because this is not observed in every patient. This is observed in some patients, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they stay up. And we don't really know, you know, in which patient is happening and why this happened. What we know from the preclinical models is that in some instances, these KRAS mutant cells that emerge in cell culture in dishes are somehow unfit. They grow very slowly unless you put an anti-EGFR targeted test. Therapy. Uh, we don't really uh, still understand uh, the, re the basis of this phenomenon, but we've seen this, we and others have actually seen these KRAS clones declining. Um, the basis of uh, this phenomenon, st trials are uh, being started. Uh, the, this is one that uh, Scott has mentioned, and it's based on the idea that you can rechallenge patient uh, in a third line therapy with an anti EGFR uh, treatment, if you had a, a, partial a partial response to the first line therapy. This will be based on the idea that mutant or resistant clones will be counter selected during the second line treatment, as depicted in this cartoon. So uh, there's been already data about rechallenge. There was indeed uh, there was early literature, and there was a uh, there, there was a poster today presented uh, by the Gona Italian group showing that indeed in patients that been rechallenged in third line after they had been responded to first line based with uh, uh, Folfiri and. Uh, um, 
Cetuxia, there were indeed a few patients, as highlighted here, that uh, benefited again from treatment and had uh, uh, long-lasting responses. So the question remained in which patient and when to rechallenge with anti-EGFR therapy. I'm afraid we don't really have an answer. What we can do is just follow the clonal dynamics of the different RAS clones, for example, uh, in plasma using liquid biopsy. Uh, we certainly need to go back to the laboratory and do more modeling experiments to understand how these um, RAS mutant clones compete and fight with the wild type clones and to be able to select patients that in third line may actually benefit from a rechallenge strategy. Uh, we just have to also to take into account that acquired resistance is heterogeneous and the multiple heterogeneous mechanisms have been found in the same patients, even in tradition, and this is going to complicate uh, all our studies in the so-called rechallenge setting. And uh, as a final slide, these are my future perspectives. As I mentioned, we should really be going back and understand how these clonal dynamics, uh, we should really model uh, this phenomenon to uh, uh, understand which type of drug combinations or maybe drug discontinuation regimens should be applied to forestall the acquisition and resistance and to actually prolong time to uh, progression. And uh, I'll, uh, hopefully, you know, we will have data uh, soon in this setting with some unconventional uh, combinations. And with this, I'd like to thank you for staying over and uh, thank people in my lab and all the clinical collaborators, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.